Today, the topic of today is addiction. Uh, addiction is probably currently still the most stigmatized psychiatric disease that we know. And therefore, I think it's important that we say a few words about the history of the concept of addiction as it developed in the last two centuries. On this picture, you see the history of addiction as we know it now. On the upper left hand side, you see the beginning of the 19th century when addic addiction was seen as a uh, a uh, moral issue. Uh, addicts were regarded as a weak-willed person with a uh, bad morals and the treatment was uh, likewise uh, that was uh, locking them up in prisons or in uh, correction centers. That changed dramatically at the end of the 19th century when people started to look at addiction very differently. It was not so, so much anymore the, the, the patient or the, the person that was weak, but it was the substance in the case uh, at that time, alcohol that was so strong. And, and that's what we call now the uh, pharmacological model of addiction. And there was actually only one uh, option that was open as a, a measure to prevent uh, addiction. It was uh, prohibit all uh, uh, alcohol uh, in the society. And that was the prohibition in, in the United States together with all the organized crime around it. If you follow the picture to the bottom and uh, more to the right, you will see that uh, uh, things changed again in the beginning of the 20th century when psychoanalysis came into focus. And people didn't look at uh, addiction as a real problem. It was actually a symptom, a symptom of an underlying uh, psychiatric disorder, in this case, a uh, personality disorder. And the treatment of addiction was actually treating of the personality disorder. That changed after the Second World War when people started to look at addiction more as a disease with genetic rules and uh, um, possible treatments by medication. In the 1970s, uh, psychology started to think about addiction and so we got the learning model of addiction and addiction was uh, bad learned behavior and there was a possibility to unlearn the behavior by cognitive behavior therapy. And finally, at the end of the 1970s, people started to think about addiction as a, a social issue. It was not abnormal behavior, but it was normal behavior in abnormal circumstances. So the only thing you had to do was change the circumstances to normal and the abnormal behavior, addiction, would disappear. So at the end of the 1970s, we had a biological model, uh, a disease model, we had a psychological model and we had the social model and that was integrated in at that time what was called the biopsychosocial model of addiction in which these three aspects, biological vulnerabilities and psychological aspects, and also the social circumstances, together created the situation of addiction for some people. In the 1990s, that are now known as the decade of the brain, of this biopsychosocial model, the biological part became more and more important. People started to see addiction more and more as a brain disease. And that's the way we look at it now. And if I say a brain disease, I, I don't mean that that psychological and sociological aspects are not important anymore, but that the understanding of the neurobiology of addiction is essentially for the understanding of the disease and for the treatment of the disease addiction. This picture shows reasons why we think addiction can be seen as a psychiatric, as a brain disorder. First of all, it's very clear that addiction is for a large part a genetic disease. If we look at addiction, then we see that 40 to 60 percent of all the, um, the variance is explained by genetic factors and only a small, relatively small part is explained by environmental factors. More important, these, these genetic factors are translated in uh, biological risk factors. And if we think about biological risk factors, we, for example, can think about people who on a genetically ba genetic basis have lower levels of dopamine receptors in certain parts of the brain, which makes them less sensitive to reward, which means that it's less easy for them to experience pleasure in normal circumstances. And what we also know is that if you use alcohol or drugs, uh, or sex for that matter, 
that these people who are not easy uh, made very happy, they can become happy by these extreme pleasurable ex experience. And actually, if you have this low level of dopamine and this low level of uh, reaction to pleasure events, your body actually invites you to use these very strong pleasure stimuli like, like drugs. Moreover, we know that people with uh, a tendency to become addicted are more impulsive. And so also this inborn impulsivity can actually make people addicted. So we have genetic vulnerability that translates itself into some biological risk factors. And actually these biological risk factors we can see in the brain. And so that's why we talk about brain abnormalities in patients with uh, uh, compulsive drug use or addiction, as we, we may say. We can see, for example, that what I just said before, the lower dopamine levels, we can show them with neuroimaging techniques. And the same is true for impulsivity. If we look at impulsivity and we ask people to respond to certain uh, stimuli, we see that addicts in general respond much quicker, and we can see that actually in brain scans. And finally, of course, it's not important that we have genetic vulnerability, biological risk factors, and, and, and brain abnormalities, but it's very important that we now know that these abnormalities can be restored, can be treated by uh, biological interventions, such as medications and, and all kinds of other biological interventions. So we do have now a lot of different medications to treat patients with addiction, including medications for the treatment of people with nicotine dependence, smokers, like uh, uh, nicotine replacement uh, uh, gums or sprays. We have a lot of medications for the treatment of uh, alcohol addiction, uh, very different medications for different kind of patients, and we have very good medications for the treatment of uh, uh, heroin dependence. Uh, unfortunately, we still lack good medication for the treatment of cocaine and, and amphetamine dependence. If I say that we have a lot of effective pharmacological interventions, medications that work against addiction, then I must at the same time say that the effect sizes are relatively small, meaning that it works, but it doesn't work in all patients. Or to be more honest, I think, it's, it works in only a minority of the patients. So we start to look now at something that is called pharmacogenomics, and it means that we look at the genetic uh, picture of people, you could say the genetic vulnerability, and see whether patients with certain genetic characteristics are responding better to certain medications than patients with uh, other genetic variables. So in this picture you can see that there are patients that uh, have uh, what we call uh, a different variants of the mu opiate receptor gene and depending on that difference whether they have basically the ASN40 or they have the ASP40 variation of the mu opiate receptor gene they will respond to naltrexone as a very effective medication for the treatment of alcohol dependence or they will not respond. And so if you treat the total population, uh, the difference between the placebo and the active medication, in this case naltroxone, is only 18, eight, sorry, it's only 8%, which means that you have to treat about 12 to 13 patients to one, to make one patient better uh, with that medication. So that doesn't look very effective. However, if you go to the subpopulation that has this uh, ASP40 variation of the mutual receptor gene, you can see that uh, the difference in response is about 39%, and you have to treat only two or three patients to make one patient more better. So that looks like a much more effective treatment. So what we know now is that addiction is genetically determined, that there are biological risk factors that we can see in the brain, that we can treat this. Uh, disorders with medication or with uh, other kinds of uh, biological treatments such as deep brain stimulations. But a final question is, can we use this model of a brain disease also to prevent addiction? And actually we can. We know now that an important risk factor for the treatment for the uh, development of, uh, of addiction, for example, addiction to nicotine or to alcohol dependence, is the presence in the youth of uh, a conduct disorder or the presence of uh, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder.
So what will happen if we actually actively treat this childhood disorder like ADHD? This uh, picture shows the difference uh, for the development of an addiction between ADHD, ADHD youngsters with, uh, with a stimulant, for example, methylphenidate. And what happens if these children are treated with uh, this uh, methylphenidate, their probability to develop uh, addiction is about uh, 20%. Whereas in patients, young patients with ADHD that are not treated with methylphenidate, their chance to develop an addiction is about 55%. So what you can see by actively treating this childhood psychiatric disorder, you can reduce uh, the probability to become addicted later in life with about 70%. So here lies a, a big opportunity. So. This is the final picture in which I try to wrap up what uh, I've been trying to explain to you in this session. First of all, I think that it's important that addiction is not a weakness, it's an illness. Addiction is a brain disease, it's a treatable brain disease. That doesn't mean that there is no psychological treatments uh, necessary or available, and also not that we don't need uh, social interventions, but for our understanding an effective treatment, we have to understand the neurobiology of addiction. Second, I've shown you a few examples of the new insights in the neurobiology of addiction. And I think it's a growing body of knowledge, and with that knowledge, we will be able to have better treatments for these patients in the future. Already, we have effective uh, pharmacological treatments, and the use of combinations of patient characteristics, such as their genetic variation, actually will increase our effectiveness in treating these people. And finally, I've shown you an example of how we can effectively uh, prevent addiction by neurobiological interventions, such as the early treatment of uh, youngsters with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So this is a great time that uh, patients with addiction have probably a better future using these new insights in the neurobiology and the neuropharmacology of this brain disease. Thank you very much.